Welcome to The Bridge. Uh, with us today is Sean Gibson. He's a self-described, quote, visually impaired British musician living in China. Sean travels around doing live videos, shows, and adventures throughout China. He sings, plays Chinese instruments, and is insanely popular on Chinese media platforms like Douyin, where he has one million followers. If you are looking for him on YouTube, search Sean Gibson or at Sean Gibson Muso, M-U-S-O. He is a British singer, songwriter, music producer, vlogger who's exploring China and the world writing music. Welcome to The Bridge, Sean. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. You know, I, I, I think the first thing people want to know is, when did you come to China and why? You know, I think that's probably where we should start. That's the first question I always like to ask foreigners as well. It's <laughs> what's your story? Why did you come? Um, for me, it all started about 10 years ago when I was studying music at Liverpool University in the UK. And half of my classmates were Chinese. Mm. And I was just super curious about where they were from, why they came to the UK. And I wanted to learn more about them and gradually started making friends. They took me to KTV. Mm. And in for, the UK. In the UK, yeah. in Liverpool. Yeah. Which is not British culture at all. Yeah. Karaoke for us is still like go, going to the pub and <laughs> having a microphone standing on stage and maybe you can choose one song, you get to sing one song for the whole night. And then for the rest of the time, you have to listen to everybody else singing. Um, but this was a whole different experience because mm. it's a private room with a TV and you can order whatever songs you want. And the music, the songs that they were choosing was obviously Chinese songs, yeah. which I'd never heard before. Mm. So for me, sitting in the KTV room, Although I was still in the UK, it really felt like I was in a different world. Mm. And I was fascinated by that. Because mm. having almost graduated, I was looking for new inspiration for my own music as well. Because although I really love Western music, and I really do, I find everything sort of recycles itself. It keeps going in circles. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, like now 80s has become really popular again. And I'm sure like in the next few years, 90s is going to become popular again. And that's great. But I wanted to find inspiration from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly I was, um, as fate would have it, just suddenly discovered Chinese music, mm. the sounds of China. So I decided to come to China myself to explore. And it was during my first trip, I found a pipa player wow. in a Chengdu shopping center. Wow. Now, I'd heard the sound of pipa before in mm -hmm. the UK, but it was always presented to me like sort of history. Mm -hmm. So I thought this, this instrument was kind of like a cultural relic, mm -hmm. not something that you would find in daily life mm -hmm. in China. So to see it played in a shopping center, just like I would find a guitar player busking on the streets of Liverpool was fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. And I realized that these instruments that do have thousands of years of history are still very much part of modern Chinese culture. So then I went down the rabbit hole mm -hmm. and found, oh, actually China also has all of these other amazing sounds, these other amazing instruments, and also 56 ethnic minorities, each with their own instruments and yeah. ways of life as well. So that's why I came and then that's why I stayed. Can I ask you how long ago was it that you moved to China? I've lived in China now for about four or five years. Wow. Oh, I first came to China 10 years ago. Well, where did you first come? Uh, I first came to Beijing, actually. Could you tell us about the first week of your time in China? What was that like? How did you find the culture was the same or different or surprised you? So the first time I landed, uh, after I landed... Um, the first thing that hit me was the food, I think. <laughs> I realized, oh, I have never tasted Chinese food before. <laughs> uh, I used to think that Chinese food was sweet and sour chicken and right, yeah, me too. Egg fried rice. Mm. And I couldn't find that on the menu anywhere here. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm. And then afterwards, actually what hit me the most during the whole trip was that just how similar it was mm -hmm. to the West mm. in a lot of ways. Because I expected, like from the news and from, from just bits of information that I'd got, I realized that China was a big place and I could see massive skyscrapers and huge metropolises of cities. But then on the other hand, I could also see these beautiful 
vast landscapes. And because I'm from the UK, which is kind of a small country, mm. I couldn't imagine that one country could have so much inside it. <laughs> so that's what blew my mind. It was the fact that all of that can exist in one place. Mm -hmm. But whilst I was in Beijing, there are still parks. There are still restaurants. There are still uh, museums. Everything... Everything is quite similar in that sense, but the expression of that is different. So I'll give you an example to explain my point. Mm -hmm. So you go to a park, mm -hmm. everyone's exercising. Yeah. But the kind of exercise that they do is different. Yeah. So people in the UK tend to run. At that time, they weren't running. Now they're running more. Mm. Um, but back, back then, it was walking backwards. Oh, yeah, for sure. Doing Tai Chi. And Have you seen the one where they bang their back against the tree? I haven't seen that one yet. <laughs> Someone told me about it. I only saw it for the first time a couple months ago. But older people, sometimes they get close to a tree and they kind of just bang their back against and what's the, the tree. wisdom behind that? I'm not sure. But is I'm going to try it for sure. <laughs> is it some kind of massage maybe to I don't know. relax? But yeah, the... they're totally different exercises. And then you have Tai Chi, sword play. I, I was really surprised. Yeah. There's old ladies with swords in the park in the morning. <laughs> yes. <Am> I... <laughs> yes. If that was in another country, it might be a different reason. Um, yeah. And... Also, my favorite is the Guangchang Wu. What's that in English? I don't know. Um, plaza dancing. Plaza, yeah, sure. Plaza square, dancing. Like square dancing. Yeah, square, square dancing. Yeah. The yeah. Damas. Yeah. And where I lived in Wuhan, they, it's on a whole other level there. Like if you go to some parts of the river, there's thousands of them all together, huge light shows and different music. It's, it's crazy. Here in Beijing, you have just little, little areas where there's like 20 or 30 or 50, but in some cities, it's just insanely big. So it was actually in Wuhan, just outside the Tangsung Temple. What's that called? The Tang Tangsung? Oh, no, that was Xi'an. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to so many places, I'm getting mixed up. So the first, yeah, it was actually Xi'an that I first saw. Oh, that's fantastic. So you said that you lived here five years, but you came, started coming here 10 years ago. So we, your first time in China was just a trip kind of to explore what was it like. Was, is that right? Yeah, exactly. So um, I, I'd learned about China from my friend's stories, um, but obviously seeing it for yourself is a very different very different thing. Well, at what point did you make the decision, well, I don't want to just visit China. I want to spend time there, like living there and experiencing it in that way. I guess I dipped, in, dipped my toe into Chinese culture enough and mm. I decided that I wanted to dive in. Um, primarily, what I really wanted to do was share Chinese culture with with more Westerners, mm -hmm. actually, because when I first came here, I was just amazed by everything. Um, for me, I was I really felt like a kid in a candy shop because in terms of inspiration, mm. you, there's just so much here mm. um, as an artist that that can inspire me. And I'm the kind of person that I find something and I want to tell everyone about it straight away. Yeah. Um, but then I realized, oh, actually, two for two reasons, I need to be here. First of all, Westerners aren't ready for it yet. Mm. At that time, they weren't ready for, for this kind of music. Mm. And the second thing was, I realized just how deep Chinese culture goes. Mm. So in, in order to share something, I really need to fully understand it. And I'm never going to be able to fully understand Chinese culture. It's way too rich and way mm. too deep. Mm. But at least I, ha I need to have a deep enough understanding of it so that when I'm putting it into my work, um, it's kind of... Respectful. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It's cultural assimilation rather than appropriation. Yeah, I see exactly what you're where you're going with that. I got to see you live recently here in Beijing. You played at Mao House in Wukasong. And one of the mm. things that you did in your performance was take a Chinese instrument out. I'm sorry, I do not know what that is called. It was kind of a flute of some kind. Hulusu. Hulusa. Uh, I've got it today. Oh yeah, that's that's fantastic. But um, so how what instruments in Chinese culture have you dabbled in, and what which ones have you really learned? So, I've dabbled in a lot. Meaning, I've written melodies and written parts for, uh, for example, pipa, gu zheng, er hu, wow. gu ting, hulusi, di zi, suo na. Um, did I say er hu? Yes, you did. Okay. Wow, that's hard. Uh, Xiao and Yangting. Did I say Yangting? I don't know. But do you say okay. you can play pipa? 
I can't play pipa, but I can write <laughs> melodies for pipa. Ah, I see, I see. So because I'm a, a songwriter um, and producer, so I can write parts for these instruments, and then I'll work with players in a recording oh, studio to wow. then bring those parts to life. Mm. So although I can't play all of the instruments, by working with the players, I get to know more about the instruments, yeah. more about how their, their specialities, because every instrument has their own technique, has their mm. own special sounds. And so I can work with the players to bring that out. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm, play I'm learning how to play hulusu wow. and also dizu. I'm not actually sure what dizu is. Oh, uh, Chinese bamboo flute. Oh, wow, that sounds beautiful. I'd love, it to, is beautiful. I'd, I'd love to hear you play it at your next performance. <laughs> yes. Uh, so one question I have is, you know, you mentioned you were really inspired by going to KTV in the UK and that yeah. this was a new music to influence your art. So it seems like you were already a musician at, by that time. So were you always a musician? Were you always a... When did that happen in your life for you? So I have loved music from the moment I was born, apparently. <laughs> um, my parents told me that I was like as soon as they put music on before I could even walk I was like moving my body I couldn't I couldn't stop um, I was on the stage the first time when I was three years old Wow <laughs> um, I was running over to my neighbor's house because he had a keyboard and I was wow. fascinated by it I was like wow you press this button and this sound comes out <laughs> this is amazing I want to do that too so from very very young age I was playing playing around with instruments and just like toys really for me, mm. just, just exploring. And when I was nine years old, I started to play piano. I had formal piano lessons, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which then allayed, enabled me to sort of bring these ideas to life. Cause through learning piano, you learn a lot about music theory mm. and you can, um, learn to write melodies for other instruments as well by using the piano. Wow. Yeah. Um, so you've also extensively written about China. Uh, when we saw you, a lot of your performances were part of your experience of traveling throughout China. Can I ask you where, from where you draw inspiration to do that? So for me, it's, um, I also make vlogs and videos about my travels in China because I like to share the experience of discovery with people as well. Mm. And so every sort of music video that I do also has a vlog attached to it. So mm. anyone that's interested in learning about how I'm inspired mm -hmm. can go and watch those as well. Mm -hmm. But it's really, it's really, I will do some research about a certain place. For example, Yunnan. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's a, a festival called Por Shui Jie, mm -hmm. and there's also so many ethnic minorities. So I just go there, immerse myself in the culture for as much as possible. And then I will write a song about um, my feelings and about the journey that I've had there. And then put some of the sounds of that local area into the music as well. For yeah. example, um, one of my songs called Xin Zai Yunnan, mm -hmm. Hearts in Yunnan. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a hulu si part in there. And that's why I started learning hulu si. So would every city that you go to that you stay for a, f a few days is going to inspire you to make a new musical piece? Yes or no? No, <laughs> <laughs> not, not only a few days, but so if I'm the, oh, if I'm the mayor of Nanjing and I'm like, Oh, I want a city. I want a song about Nanjing. I just, all I have to do is invite Sean there. Would that happen? <laughs> that's happened. Uh, are, you, are you listening? That's actually if you're the happened. mayor of a, of a, a city, just, Sean just needs I wrote a, hotel. a song called Changsha <laughs> City. Yeah, fantastic. And yeah, because I've spent more time. It, it really depends where I've spent more time as well. So mm. um, I've spent a lot of time in Changsha and also in Guangdong, Da Wan Chu, mm -hmm. the big bay, greater bay area, right? Yeah. In English. That's right. Yeah. Greater bay area. Greater bay that's area. Correct. So I've written songs about those two areas. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, about my experiences there. So the local culture, the local food, the local hangout places, these kind of things. You no, know, I noticed that your inspiration seems to come from everywhere because I was on your YouTube. Uh, Douyin's less accessible to me. But some of them are like about video games, for example. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the story behind those are they're actually cover songs. So mm. they're songs that have already been written for games yeah in either in the chinese language or japanese language or first japanese then chinese and then i like because i, I just love the melodies i yeah. love the songs so i just kind of want to do my 
rendition of an English version. You know, I noticed you also sing in Chinese. Do you think that is one of the things that has brought you popularity here in China? Um, I don't know, to be honest. I think there are a lot of foreigners who can also sing in Chinese. Um, you, so you're how, you, you mentioned going before the interview, you mentioned going to Suzhou to study Chinese. Is that right? Yeah, that's so right. How good is your Chinese? How's it going? Can my, you have a basic conversation with people? Yeah, I'd say my Chinese level is pretty conversational. Mm. Um, I can do interviews in Chinese now. Um, wow. But if it's talking about topics that I'm not that familiar with... Because there'll be specialty words. There are lots of specialty words, exactly. So you do have now about a million fans on Douyin. You have a lot of fans on other platforms as well, including YouTube. But, you know, a million fans on, on one platform, that's crossing kind of an important marker. How do you feel about your popularity here in China? Um, I think it's just a sign that what I'm doing matters to people, mm -hmm. I guess, because as an artist, I create the works that in that are an expression of myself. Sure. And to put that into the, out into the world and have people um like it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's really all an artist can ask for right so yeah. the having a million followers on doyen a million followers on billy billy and other other platforms really is just a sort of sign that what i'm doing is worthwhile to people mm, absolutely and worth carrying on so you know and your fame continues to grow outside of china as well so you mentioned earlier in, the, in this interview that you were originally trying to tell china's story to the world yeah. To, to people outside of China. So uh, are you satisfied that a lot more people outside of China are now taking an interest in your music as well? Um, increasingly, but nowhere near on the scales that I'm, I would like. Yeah. Um, I'm really hoping that in the next few years I can um, reach more people worldwide. But I'm also a slave to an algorithm just like everybody else. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So it's finding the right... Um, the right package mm. that people can enjoy because I've been in China now for so long. I I kind of get a taste for what my Chinese fans like. Right. But, yeah. But internationally, it's a little bit more tricky because there are so many different cultures as sure. well outside, yeah, yeah, yeah. and everyone has the like YouTube, for example. Um, what British people like to watch and what people in Malaysia like to watch is probably very different. So mm. I need to find my audience. My, I haven't quite found my international audience yet, mm, mm. but well, it's increasing. You're from the UK. Wouldn't that, that's your, would you say that's the center of your, you know, target? Not really. No, no, not really. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm from the UK, but I don't really see myself as British or, or anything. I, I just see myself as an international citizen, as oh, you like. Yeah. I'm just a person of the world. And, um, Wherever my people are where, is wherever they are, you know, in terms of fans. And I appreciate every single one of them. Yeah. In fact, there's a guy on YouTube, which, which makes me smile. Um, he's a Russian guy listening to a British guy singing in Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> that sums up the kind of audience I want. So very international. So yeah. you, most people come to China for one year or two years. You've been here living here five years, you say. So yeah. what has, did you always intend to stay in China long term? Or did, was that something you decided after you were living here? I'm the sort of person that um, kind of fears, fearlessly follows the river of life wherever it may go. Um, I like to seize life by the horns. I initially just sort of thought I'd, I'd come and travel here and then go back. And then that turned into living here. And now I don't have any plans to leave. So yeah. I think that's a common story with a lot of expats, right? I a think lot of long-term expats have a very similar story, but not all expats become long-term expats. That's true. Yeah. That's true. So for those of us who have stuck around, we have a similar story. We came here for a year or two and then, wow, I really like it. I'll just stay. <laughs> right? Well, can I ask why you decided to stay? Well, I'm actually the exception. I, when I came to China, I intended on staying here. So oh, okay. I, I've not met anyone else who said that. Everyone says, oh, I'm coming for a year or two. And I got, I, I just loved it and I stayed. But for me personally, I was like, I'm moving to China. I'm just, that's it. Wow. <laughs> well, everyone could see the graphs of the, the Chinese economy skyrocketing for the next 30 years. And I was like, that sounds like a nice place to live. <laughs> yeah. Actually, going back 10 years now, I also had a similar idea. Um, 
I could see China rising, and I was also very curious about this. Mm. What, what, what is this? Where does this country come from? Yeah, because for me, it was like being blindsided. I had no concept of China. Mm. Um, like twelve years ago, I didn't. I, I honestly, I couldn't differ- differentiate anything, any country in Southeast Asia. Yeah, me too. Yeah, it was all just oh, Southeast Asia, and then after I met the Chinese friends and started getting into the culture, I was like, wow, okay. This is amazing.、Mm. Can I ask you about writing music? It's something that I don't really do. So,、uh, where does that start? Do you sit down and use the melody first, or do you have the idea for the the philosophical idea you want to impart, or is, is it a feeling, or do you pick up an instrument and just start playing? Where does it? Where do you begin? All of the above. All of the above. So different times, different strategies. Exactly. Maybe you just happen to have this instrument sitting around, so that's where it comes from. Yeah, exactly. It really depends on. Sometimes I really sit down and intentionally say, "Okay, today I want to write a song."、Um, other times, it can, I can be walking around a place and just be absorbing everything, and then a few days later, I go home, and then suddenly this song gets downloaded into my brain. Yeah. <laughs>、um, in completion, like I can hear everything、really? in my mind. Yeah. Wow. They're the best ones. The best ones are where I don't have to do anything. All I have to do is like act like a pen. So you brain just write it down. Some part of your brain just does it for you. Yeah, and then you're just transcribing it. Yeah, exactly. You get, it feels like that. Do you get music in your dreams that come like that? Like,、um, oh, then what's that melody from my dream like? <laughs> no, it's more like daydreaming. Daydreaming. Yeah. So yeah. it'll be like walking home or walking around a park or something like that, and then suddenly this inspiration comes out of somewhere, some mystical place. When you're right, when you're composing in Chinese. In the Chinese language, do you run by the grammar with someone? So the Chinese, I don't write the Chinese lyrics myself. Oh yeah, my Chinese level isn't that good yet. Wow. So I'll first write、um, an English version, and then have that, and then work with another person to help、mm. me to rewrite the same, the same feelings or the same emotion or the same topic or whatever it is、um, into Chinese. You know, you mentioned traveling around China, and we all seen a lot of videos of you in you of you. Throughout different parts of China, some of the most beautiful places like Yunnan, like we mentioned, and Xi'an, which is also famous for being an ex- you know amazingly beautiful city,、um, could you tell us about some of the places that you've been? Yeah, what、um, stands out for Sean? I'm glad you didn't ask me the question that most people ask, which is, "What's your favorite place in China?" <laughs> I'm like, that's a terrible question. I can't answer that. It's too many yeah, places. What's your favorite movie? It's impossible to answer. <laughs> what's your favorite song? Yeah, Christ, I don't even have a favorite decade. <laughs>、um, uh, let me have a think. Suzhou is definitely a beautiful place,、mm. full of rich culture and history.、Um, very relaxed city.、Um, Beijing as well. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time in Beijing. I really love Beijing. It's the capital. It's、mm-hmm. got a lot of.、Um, it's got the Forbidden City and、mm-hmm. all of that kind of、um, grand royal kind of feeling、mm-hmm. behind it.、Mm-hmm. Lots of red and gold, and yeah, it's a fantastic backdrop for music videos. <laughs> <laughs>、um, but also places like Chongqing. I love Chongqing. Chongqing,、yeah. I describe as. A spicy city, <laughs> yeah, and it really is an attack on the senses. Everyone、mm. there is so spicy as well. I think it's all of the chili that they're eating, <laughs> and it's just so lively.、Mm. Uh, have you ever been to Chongqing? Yeah, I was just there this year for the first. Oh, sorry, last year for the first time because I hadn't. I've been here twelve years, had never gone, and I was like, you know, this is one of the biggest four cities in the country. I really got sh- to go, so I spent a few days there. It was very lovely. I was actually incredibly surprised. It looks more monumental than some of the other cities because they're on hills, and so you see skyscrapers at different levels everywhere. It gives it's a very interesting kind of style for a city. And you never know what floor you're on because <laughs>、yeah. there's like three ground floors. Yeah, it's the first time I arrived in Chongqing. Actually,、um, we arrived at our hotel. And I was looking around, and was, there's no hotel here, but it's definitely this location. <laughs> and we were on the roof. <laughs> wow! And we looked down, and it was a 30-story building.、Wow. And we were on the roof terrace when we arrived. But it looks like the ground floor because it's literally built into the side of the mountain. Yeah, it's an incredible place. And、um, yeah, the first time I went there, I thought everyone was shouting at each other. I thought everyone was having an argument、mm. because they speak with such passion、yeah. and ferocity.、Mm. Um, that it sounds like an argument. 
And yeah. even now, I, I'm only just being able to tell every time I go back, I'm only just being able to tell if they're, they're arguing or not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was the way Beijing, I found Beijing 10 years ago. It's not true anymore, but 10 years ago, the Lao Beijing people, the original Be Beijingers of Beijing, they do that too. They yell at each other, but they're just like talking. Yeah. But it seems to have kind of gone away or like you know been subsided subsumed in the in the new modernity of the city so i think maybe is that why is that because so many yd ren have gone there i don't know or yeah maybe like, maybe, maybe so yeah, many yeah, yeah, exactly. people from dongbei and other right. areas have gone so they've i don't know they're like mixing up and culture is becoming more national as opposed to yeah. local you know i don't think you'll ever tame chongqing ren <laughs> same same question but just about music you know are there cities that you go to that are you find especially musical where the people are playing music outside or in venues where you're like well this city stands out because it is a haven of a specific kind of music um i'd say well i went to celebrate uh portrait right here water water splashing festival sure i think it is in english <laughs> and last year in in sichuan bana in yunnan and that was an amazing experience yeah absolutely amazing um there's so many songs and instruments and music and crazy water fights and it's all this kind of religious ritual actually mm. but to go there and experience that and just be in, in the heart of that was an amazing experience. So I'd say Xichuan Mana definitely has a very rich culture. It's very tangible. Yeah. Um, and, but also, at the same time, I also went to uh, Chaoshan, this just, just spring festival just gone, and experienced the wildest spring festival celebrations I have ever had in my life. Um, firecrackers you have never experienced firecrackers until you go to Chaoshan really so literally every shop has their their door frames lined with them wow. <laughs> and they're all set off at the same time and it's literally like this explosion there's a video of me on Douyin running away because I'm just scared <laughs> <laughs> and fireworks and but but more importantly there's there's just so many like uh religious ceremonies and celebrations like mm -hmm. um they they have this it's really hard for me to talk about this in english <laughs> <laughs> i'm just so used to talking in chinese so how to say uh yolong how to say yolong yolong uh a dragon long? walking wandering dragon wandering dragon i don't know yolong. wandering dragon know. okay so it's like a lion uh, a a dragon Dance, long dance, long dance. Mm. Um, in a, in, and they start in a square. There are three of them. Mm. And then they all kind of wander off in different directions around the town or around mm. the village to bring good fortune to the local people. Yeah, yeah. And at every stop, they, they have like different stops along the way. Yeah. And at every stop, they set off the firecrackers and fireworks. And obviously, there are three of these longs all in, in nearby to each other. Yeah. So you literally look around the city, 360 degrees. Yeah. There are firecrackers going off and fireworks and everywhere. Dragons. And it's just incredible. And that's just one event in yeah. one village. Wow. Every village. And when I say village, I actually mean city village. Yeah. So it's kind of like a district. And right. every single district will have one of these going on. So one of these, this one finishes, the other one starts, and it's every day. Wow. Every day for, a t for at least two weeks or three weeks. That sounds amazing. It is incredible. I think you've done more in this like five, last five minutes to sell people on coming to China than any interview I've ever done before. <laughs> <laughs> Where have you not been in China yet that you still want to go? Um, I haven't been to Inner Mongolia yet. Oh, there's a lot of music up there, too. There's a lot of yeah. music there. I'm the, the, really fascinated by the deep singing, yeah. the deep voice singing, and also the uh, ma tou ting, horse head fiddle? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. What is it horse head fiddle? I, I don't think. know. You don't know? I don't know. Okay, I, we, well. I, when I went, we, we specifically went to one of those restaurants that has music, live music. We had to wait in the restaurant three hours early just to get a seat where we're just sitting there drinking tea for three hours before this event would start. But yeah, they there were a bunch of different instrumentalists and singers, and they had the throat singing. It was amazing. It was well well worth it. And I'd also love to visit um, western areas of Sichuan and also going to Tibet as well, because mm. there's some songs from Zhangzhou, um, Zhang, uh, 
Tang ethnic minority group, mm. which are just absolutely soul touching to mm. me. I was walking on the streets in um, in a town just outside of Chengdu, and I just came across this this guy singing in the street, yeah. playing his guitar and singing, and it was the most beautiful s singing I've ever heard in my life. Wow! It just touched my soul, so I definitely have to go and find more like him. Yeah, yeah. I found Chengdu to be fascinating as well. Okay, I have another question about you as a performer because we went to see you in Mao House. Obviously, you travel around China to different venues and you have a huge fan base. People have, what are those like, not LED lights, but those uh, those <laughs> lights that light up the stores use and they were holding them up with your name on them and it was amazing. Oh, yeah. It was outstanding. So, you know, when I go to see my favorite band, my favorite performers, there's usually a song that everyone wants to hear. So you go see Radiohead, you want to hear Creep, right? Yeah. So are there specific songs that your audience are like demanding that you perform every time that you go out? Mm, I haven't had a huge hit yet. <laughs> I haven't gone to be a whore. So I'm not, I'm not, everyone has a different favorite at the moment. Mm, sure. Um, some of the favorites are Journey, the last song that I did, yeah. the final, the finale. The encore, um, pass it on is also another favorite, um, and yeah, I think they're the two that stand out for so me people, that most people request, so and also some ones. cover songs as well. Like, well, for example, that I've done, like uh, "Lonely Warrior." Is it a Chinese song? Yeah, "If I Stay." Some people have been with me since I covered "If I Stay," literally like nine years ago. Yeah, I do notice Which is amazing. we were talking about a friend of ours, Mark Levine, who's a singer songwriter. He covers Chinese songs. And sometimes I love his, his original music. I really do. I think it's some really amazing. But when he covers a Chinese song, you can see Chinese people like Whoa. <laughs> sitting up. Wow. He knows a Chinese song. So it's very you know impressive for foreigners when they have that uh, skill. Can I ask you a different question? Um, what do you, you know, you've been here a long time. What about your family back home in the UK? What do they think about you living here for so long? Um, I think my mum would hope that I'd go and move back to the UK. Because <laughs> sure. uh, her little boy's, you know, on the other side of the world. But they also really respect my decision to be here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they also love watching my videos and hearing my stories <laughs> right. about China. Sure, yeah. That makes it easier because she can always just turn YouTube on and watch you. Yeah, they're really uh, supportive and... They also plan to come and visit this year. For the first time? For the first time, like, yeah. Where are you going to take them? Which for them is huge yeah. because they're the sort of people that just like to, they, they've spent 90% of their life in the same town. Mm. They don't really go anywhere. And, and a holiday for them is traveling like two hours to another town, which to me looks exactly <laughs> the same. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but for them, so for, the, for them to travel, even, even to travel on a plane for 10 and a half hours, 11 hours to make the journey for them is a huge step. So mm. um, the fact that I'm able to sort of, I guess, inspire them to come is, yeah. is really nice. It's kind of like, thanks, parents. Now you can come and, you know, thank you for bringing me up and thank you for making me the person that I am today. Yeah. And like, here's the gift of China. <laughs> <laughs> the gift of China. Well, I'm going to ask you a question. Besides the Great Wall and the Forbidden City, what do you want them to see when they get here? Um, I hope to give them the kind of experience that they want to have because mm. I've fallen in love with Chinese culture for the reasons that, that I have because I love music and right. I think um, my dad really loves food he's a big foodie yeah so I've got to take him to Chengdu and Chongqing oh, yeah, to try because yeah, sure. he loves spicy food as well oh wow That'd and be also a challenge <laughs> yeah and also they love crispy duck in the UK yeah but they've never had Beijing Kao Yao. Oh, yeah. They've never had Peking duck. You know, I've it's only learned different. recently that Nanjing has their own, like, oh, no, 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 our duck is better than Beijing. So there's a rivalry there. I want to compare now. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I'd only ever heard outside of China that Beijing duck, oh, you need to go try that. Then I, I met some Nanjing folks, and they were like, no, 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 Nanjing duck. It's it's all about our duck. <laughs> and I think Guangdong also has duck. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> and pigeon. Regional competition for who has the yeah. best duck. And I think for my mom, she just loves to be in nature, mm. which China is, has an abundance of. Sure, yeah. So I'll probably take my mom to see the rainforests and the mountains. Wow. When I was in, I was, I felt very lucky. I got to Chengdu and uh, we went to some small town. I can't remember where it was, Lishan or something like that. And we went to a Buddhist temple in the middle of the day and it just started bucketing raining. I mean, I, like rain I haven't seen in 10 years. And I felt 
in that moment, very fortunate because I was under a roof, but looking out at this spectacle of like rain and I wasn't like, oh no, I'm trapped here. I can't get to a car or something. I was just like, maybe this is one of the most resplendent things I've ever experienced. Wow. So, you know, uh, you know, bad weather can be good too, you know, in terms of that kind of stuff. Um, what about, you know, you, you say you want to share Chinese music with the world. What about your experience of living in China? Sometimes folks back home don't always have the, don't always see China in the way that we do. So how do you think that your experience of China is different from how people may imagine China? Well, how is China different than sometimes how it exists in the imagination of people back home? Ooh, that's a tricky question because yeah. I think everybody has their own experiences and everyone's had different messages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'd say anyone that hasn't been to China mm -hmm. really knows, knows very little about China. <laughs> yeah. Unless they've read books or watched a lot of vlogs and have really researched or studied or has an interest. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I think people don't really have any idea. Yeah. Because China's way too big, mm. way too complicated, mm. and has a cultural history of thousands of years. Mm. How can anyone understand that without either studying it or experiencing it for themselves? Right. I yeah. think the, 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 the biggest thing is that China, by Westerners, I think is seen as a nation state. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. I don't see it like that. Mm -hmm. I see China as a civilization mm -hmm. that's, that's gone through various, various empires, various times. And I think, but, but what stayed the same is the Chinese civilization throughout, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does make, it makes a lot of sense. And I think that's the first the language Confucianism, all, music. Yeah. Sure. But Westerners, have this concept of a nation state, which is very different. It's like, oh, this is our land. We are British because of this part of the land. Whereas Chinese people and Chinese civilization, you're Chinese wherever you are in the world mm -hmm. because it's in your DNA. Mm. If that makes sense. Like I don't go around saying I'm Caucasian, <laughs> right? I say I'm British, Sure. but Chinese is an ethnicity just as much as it is a nation. Mm. And I think that's a very big differentiation between Western psyche and Chinese psyche. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, apart from the obvious things like bias propaganda that people are exposed to, I think unless you have studied uh, or you've been to China yourself, mm -hmm. people really know very little. So my advice for anyone who would like to come to China mm -hmm. is to do that research, is to um, listen to different voices from different angles. Mm -hmm. I mean, go on YouTube and listen to the people that, that say China is, you know, this terrible dictatorship. Go on it, listen. Go on the, and then listen to the alternative view. Mm -hmm. And then come to China for yourself and make your own choice. Yeah. Well, I mean, make I, your honestly, own decision. I make, agree with you. People to people exchanges, getting more people to come. You know, I think for me personally, uh, you mentioned the, how similar the UK is to China when you first came here. Yeah. I, I felt the same way in terms of family values. You know, my family back home is very you know, conservative in their own way. And, you know, everything is about taking care of your family, taking care of your brother, your sister, your, your neighborhood, you know, having duty to your town, all that kind of stuff. And I found it's very similar to China. People here are very family oriented, taking care of their parents, taking care of their kids, the brother, sister. So I was like, there's way more that was similar than anything else. Yeah, and I think deeper than that as well, for me, the reason why, one of the reasons why I love going to um, explore these different local cultures, like, mm -hmm. like I did in Chaoshan and I have yeah. this wonderful experience. One of the reasons why I can do that is because I feel welcomed. Yeah. I feel like I can. Yeah. Like as an outsider going to experience these cultures for the first time, every time I go there, the locals are so happy to see me. Mm -hmm. They're so welcoming. They welcome me with open arms mm. and even invite me in to have a look behind the scenes yeah. and to learn more about the culture because they're so proud of it. Mm -hmm. And they, want, they also want to share it with more people. Yeah. And so it, it's such a heartwarming experience and I'm so privileged to, to have the opportunity as well. Mm. And I think that's one of the reasons why I fell in love with Chinese culture is just I was welcomed with open arms. Mm. And how can you not 
you know, to be embraced by people like that is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's absolutely what I stand for as well. Yeah. Because for me, in a world where there are so many voices trying to create division, mm -hmm. I just hope I can use my voice, mm -hmm. no matter how big or small, mm -hmm. to spread just the idea of, of bringing people together yeah. instead of creating division. Absolutely. Well, you also make a lot of videos. In addition to your vlogs, you make travel videos. You also make music videos. Are you producing the, the music videos? Is it your vision? Is it someone else's vision? Do you hire a team? Do you have a team? How does that work? So I will work with my team to come up with ideas. And so I'm kind of like co I'm producer, I guess. So it's like, okay, let's go and make a video in Yunnan and incorporate the local peacock dance. Yeah. And the Dai Tu Duang and these kind of things. And then my team will go out and help me to make that happen sure. and find the right people and makeup artists and dancers and things like that. It's just so the vision starts often starts with you. You have, oh, I want to do it this way. It represents the song to you in this way. Because I notice in... in yeah, a it's a discussion. It's definitely a discussion because I also need my team to give me ideas mm. because obviously I'm, I'm not from these local areas. So sure. I need to do right. the research first. Yeah. And obviously I'm one person. I don't have all the time in the world, sadly, to do all the research myself. So they'll give me ideas and then I will sort of say, okay, well, which ones can we work with? And then move forward from that. It's a collaborative effort. Sure. You, you have very good relationship with a lot of uh, Chinese colleagues and a lot of people are really excited to see you. Even people who have, who haven't met you before after your last show, there was a line of 20 people trying to get your autographs, buy your merchandise and so <laughs> forth. You know, that's not, you know, I, I have a, positive experience of China too. I go out, meet people, they're happy to meet me. But you have obviously a different experience because your music is uh, tying you with people who, you know, they've seen you online and they're very excited to, to meet you. Can you tell us how your music has influenced your ability to make strong bonds with, with Chinese people? I think I'm just very grateful that people enjoy the music that I make. Yeah. And, and it really started... Um, the first time I ever sang a Chinese song mm. for Chinese people, for a Chinese audience, mm. and they ab abrupted into thunderous applause. <laughs> and I felt that embrace. I felt that, oh, you're one of us. If, mm. you, if, you, if you love our culture this much, feel free to make it part of yourself. So I feel like I'm one of them mm. in a lot of respects, because if you, if you love a culture so much and you make it part of yourself, um, that kind of connection is really strong. It's really powerful. Mm -hmm. So if people are also enjoying the work that I'm making as well, and, and that, that just can only sort of reinforce that connection, reinforce that bond. Mm -hmm. I feel very, I feel very honored. Back home, um, you played piano. What other instrument, Western instruments had you learned? Guitar, presumably? Yeah, guitar a little bit and clarinet. Clarinet, wow, fantastic. Yeah, that's probably why I can sort of naturally go to the Hulusa, maybe. Oh, so you like wind instruments. Yeah. Yeah. But you, if you play piano, are there similar instruments to piano in China? Or is would you say that Chinese people also enjoy the piano quite a bit, too? Yeah, and lots probably of one of the yeah. most like world-renowned pianists is also Chinese. Yeah. Long long. Wow. Yeah. Um, in terms of... There are... There are um, sorry to answer your question. Oh, go ahead, please. Um instruments that are like piano i don't think there's any instrument in the world that's quite like piano but there are certain instruments that can be fill a certain a similar function like guzheng yeah sure because essentially a piano is kind of a stringed instrument even though you don't see the strings yeah right yeah it's but it's it's played with hammers so actually piano is short for piano forte which means soft loud because previously there were harpsichord instruments but they could only pluck the strings mm. so there's only one volume and although it's a nice sound, it was quite limited in terms of the expression that it could portray. Mm -hmm. So then this guy made a piano and it could suddenly, by, by hitting the strings with hammers, yeah. can be so much more expressive. Mm. So that's how piano came about. I'd like if you could tell us, because we don't all have your talent, so we can't have the same experiences as you, but you probably have more opportunity to surprise people in 
interesting circumstances. For example, you ever go to KTV with people who don't know that you're, you have these talents and then just when you open up, could you tell us a story like that where maybe people were surprised to see your skills? Um, I don't really think I have any experiences like that because if I go to KTV, it's mostly with my friends. Yeah. Although I guess, oh, you weren't there, were you? I was tired. Oh, you were tired. <laughs> I suddenly remembered. Yeah, in in um, I was on a trip in Harbin. Yeah, and with a group of foreigners, we all went there to to vlog the the Harbin city, and I went to the KTV with them afterwards and yeah not many of them knew that i was a singer and actually i i put one of my own songs <laughs> on in the ktv in fact it wasn't me it was my my friend he put my song You're on in, in the, the ktv yeah and there wow. was some people you know we'd had a few drinks and there were some people that weren't quite making the connection between <laughs> wait the guy on the tv screen and the guy singing is the same guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that was yeah, pretty cool that is pretty cool so now every time i go to the ktv I, i'm always like oh have they got one of my songs or not <laughs> that's just that, curious that is fascinating actually yeah they, they oftentimes have massive selections on those computers in fact sometimes it's just the hook to the internet you can get pretty much anything so what about people who are considering moving to china right they're like oh you know that does sound interesting i would like to do that i would like to come what kind of advice would you give them to get ready i think just um, probably watch more videos mm. online and do your research. I think the best thing is if you can find a friend, find yeah. a Chinese friend who can introduce the parts of Chinese culture that they really like mm. and share stories about their life and mm. then come and, and, and experience it for, for yourself. Be ready for hot water all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's also good advice. You know, I, I was su found, found it surprising. I go into a lobby, sit down, someone bring me a little cup of hot water. It's like, Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's calling on. Yeah, I, and I also think expect, come with an open mind. I think that is the most important thing. Come with an open mind and expect to feel overwhelmed mm. because there's so much here. Yeah, well, you know, what's in the future? What's in your future? Where are you going in terms of learning instruments or music that you have planned? Or, you know, uh, are you planning on staying in Beijing long term? What do you think is in the next couple of years for you? Um, in the next couple of years, I plan to keep traveling around China and writing more songs, getting more inspiration and putting everything, everything that I see and hear into my music. I'm also um, planning to start a live stream room as well. I'm going to start live streaming. Live stream? Um, well, could you tell us about that? So I've also found that um, there are lots of really amazing stories behind um, some of the products that are in China as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's a part of culture that I haven't really explored yet. Um, it's kind of the gap between the commerce and the culture. So, for example, like Lao Gamma, mm -hmm. this product. Yeah. Okay, so where, where is, what is the story of Lao Gamma? Yeah. I've never really questioned that, and I'd like to. So who is Lao Gamma? Was she a real person? <laughs> Was she not? Okay, she wasn't. So why did they choose to use her? Where is it from? Where's the roots of that? And that really tell the background stories of these products. Wow, that's very, very fascinating and interesting. What platforms? So this will be like on? This will be on Douyin. Douyin. Yeah, but I need to reach a million followers first. So please follow. Because <laughs> otherwise I'm not allowed to live stream. Really? Yeah. You can't yeah. live stream on Douyin without a million followers. I yeah. didn't I didn't know that that was a thing. Well, yeah. I'm going to have to try a lot harder because I don't even have 10% <laughs> of that. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, how long did it take you to go from zero to one, almost 1 million now? Um, it's taken a few years. A few yeah, years. Yeah, it's taken a few years. And you, you, you upload a lot of content. Yeah, I do. So for your content that is in English, do you have subtitles? Uh, yeah. I have sub subtitles in English and Chinese. So even when you're Every singing video. a Chinese song, there's Chinese, there's Chinese subtitles. Yeah. Yeah. Because I hope to let as many people understand it as possible. So sometimes, in fact, some of the funny comments I get are some of the haters, because everyone has haters, right? It's, mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. the Chinese version is so much better than the English version. Wow. But actually, they're <laughs> just reading the Chinese translation of the English version. <laughs> oh, yeah. I see what you're saying. Right? Yeah. You know, I, I, I've also heard a lot of covers of Chinese music that are just, both are really good. The original and the new, new version are, are both really, really impressive. Thank you. And also, it's really important that I, I write down the Chinese translation of the English lyrics as well, because the meanings change a little bit, or the metaphors that I'm using are different. 
And you know, translation in its, uh, itself is actually really challenging because are you translating the literal translation or are you translating the meaning behind the, the lyrics? No, I'm definitely not translating directly because if you translate directly, you find there's a funny guy on Billy Billy who does this. Yeah. He translates uh, Chinese songs directly into English and they sound terrible. But that's the idea. It's for comedy value. It's hilarious. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, and but So what I need to do is to really get behind the meaning behind the lyrics. Mm-hmm. So every every lyric has a surface level meaning, like a direct meaning, but mm-hmm. then there's a culture behind that. Yeah. And then there are metaphors that that are being used to express certain things. So like, for example, the moon in Chinese culture represents loneliness. Oh yeah. But it doesn't really represent loneliness in the West, right? I would, I'm not really sure. I think Jung said is mystery or something like that. Mysteriousness. Yes. So when I think of the moon, I think of Michael Jackson turning into a <laughs> werewolf. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't think of loneliness because right. the stories that we tell around certain things are different. So there's a whole cultural background behind mm. certain things that are very different. So a song like The Moon Represents My Heart is kind of difficult to translate yeah. because the moon doesn't represent loneliness right so what metaphor do you use to represent loneliness then it sounds and well that's just one aspect of what you do i have another question actually I, I i kind of already asked all my questions but i still have a lot left over anyway you mentioned working with people who play other instruments mm. and you know you're helping conduct you're in a conversation about where the music is going are there sometimes when you want a specific Chinese instrument or a Western instrument and you have to bring in someone special just for that song because you don't have anyone on your team right now, currently maybe, who plays that instrument specifically? So I work with players mostly in Beijing. Yeah. A lot of them are students at the music school here. Mm. Um, other people are people that have recommended to me through friends in the industry. Mm-hmm. And... Yeah, I, I work with some regular players as well. I have like my Swan Hour player, and if my Swan Hour player isn't available, then I've got a backup, and then I've got like, yeah, yeah. I can always ask around. I've got a big enough network to be able to find the players that I need. I guess the next question would be, you know, you mentioned at the beginning that there are so many varieties of music that you'll never be able to explore them all because Chinese culture is so deep. Yeah. So are there sometimes when when you're thinking about in my future three or four songs, I I, I would like to play with this specific kind of music and cross it with a guitar. Are you having that kind of vision where you're like, well, I haven't done that yet. That's got to come down the line some, at some point. Yeah, for sure. There are so many ideas I've got on the, on the shelf, if you yeah, like, sure. that I haven't gotten around to yet, but they're kind of shouting at me. Please yeah. come and pay attention <laughs> to me. One of them is actually toys. Toys. Like toy toys. Yes, ancient toys. Ancient toys. Yeah, so I filmed a um, an interview in one of the hutongs in a small shop, mm. like a cultural shop. And there were so many relics, and there were toys. They're all toys, and they had the most incredible sounds. Wow. So I would love to... Toy musical instruments. Yeah, like toys. Hey. Like like whistles and little, oh, wow. little percussion things. And some of them you can actually make melodies. So I'm thinking about maybe... Some of them only have one pitch, mm-hmm. but I thought it'd be a really interesting idea to combine um, the kind of ancient toy with a yeah. technology and sample them. So sample the sound, and then I can repitch the sound. Oh, yeah, sure. And then make a melody from that. Well, that's I think that would be a really cool idea. Yeah, that is really next level, kind of almost techno level sort of stuff. Yeah. That's fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, thank you so much for your time, Sean, for coming on the bridge. And uh, we can find you on Doyin. and we can also find you, find you on YouTube. Where would you prefer people find you? Anywhere that's easiest for them. And so just look up Sean Gibson. Is there a Chinese name that on, uh, on Douyin? Xiaoen. Xiaoen. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.